Welcome back, everyone, to another What is This Weapon? Well, right off the bat, I can tell you that this is a less lethal weapon, um, or in British terminology, an anti-riot gun. But there are many anti-riot guns, or were, uh, in British service. So this is specifically the Webley Shermley. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, Sher Shermley were uh, a well, p perhaps better known for their rocket apparatus. So they had a line-throwing, life-saving uh, rocket system. They made signal pistols as well. In fact, there was a signal pistol based on the exact same, um, well, this bit, basically, <laughs> of this gun. But this is their, uh, the, the, Sh the Shermerly companies, because uh, they, they were the ones to actually market and sell it, anti-riot gun. Webley, obviously, Webley and Scott, if you know about uh, British firearms history. So the Webley and Scott are the manufacturer. Shermerly, uh, or Shermerly, are the front, I suppose, the, the company that actually marketed and, marketed and sold this thing, as well as the life-saving apparatus. Um, that, that's the, the business that they were in. So the time frame here is round about, well, we could pick up round about 1970, I think, because from that point on, we see uh, the British army and the British security forces in Northern Ireland picking up um, several systems. So there were four in use throughout the, the period that became known as the Troubles um, from about 1969 onwards uh, through to, well, the Good Friday Agreement 1997 when things got substantially better. Um, in that situation. Now, there was there were sort of urban pacification requirements before Northern Ireland, British involvement in, in Northern Ireland. Um, the first significant modern attempt with something like a riot gun that I know of was Hong Kong. So there was um, there were, there were m almost certainly federal riot guns. That's one of the four that were that was in use early on in the troubles in Northern Ireland as well. And those things were punting out wooden batten rounds. Uh, they're called batten rounds for a reason. Uh, the, the, the old term was truncheon. Well, if you sk if some of those small police truncheons, you know, these batten rounds weren't that much smaller than some of those. I mean, they were, but they were they were small enough to be able to launch, be launched out of a uh, what we now call a less lethal, uh, was then called a non-lethal weapon, and they cause they cause pain. Uh, they get they. They, they achieve their desired effect via essentially pain compliance. So you, you reconsider your life choices when you get hit by a lump of wood. So that was the case in the late 60s. Um, around about 1970, uh, the Federal Riot Gun, that's, that's an American, American weapon system, if you, if you want to call it that. Uh, pretty good, uh, off the shelf, 37 millimeter um, anti-riot gun. And then that is joined quite quickly by the L48A1 and the L67A1. Um, there's L67 all the way through to A4, I believe, possibly possibly more. And so those two systems were the, the mainstay of the British Army, um, that capability in Ulster, right through until 97 and beyond, actually. And they were then replaced by, a, well, by the HK69 grenade launcher, actually, or launcher. Um, so the, the, the odd one out is this. It's the, the Webley Chevrolet multi-purpose gun. And that was not a British Army riot gun. This was used by the Royal Ulster Constabulary. So the essentially the local police force responsible for um, safety and security uh, in the province. And having their own procurement lines and everything, they had their own riot gun. So you will see in footage and photos from the time um, we, we were involved recently in a, a BBC documentary um, presenting the sort of technical side of, of these systems. And you might just glimpse this one on camera because it did make a cameo. But the, the main thrust of that was the British Army's, uh, or at least the guns that we looked at were, were, were mainly the British Army ones. Um, and we're dis discussing things like, well, rifling as it was a key aspect. So this thing, if I open it up for you. You'll see, I think, that is in fact smoothbore. 
the Federal Riot Gun, or FRG, that was in initial British Army service, um, and then alongside the L-48 and the L-67, till about 1980, when it was discontinued, that was also smooth bore. The L-48 was smooth bore. Only the L-67 was rifled. And we have in the collection actually converted L-48s that have a, literally a thin metal sleeve with rifling grooves uh, cut into it to convert the thing into a rifled gun. More accurate, essentially. So there's a whole, whole story there about um, what you know, the, the, the British authorities using certain types of projectiles and certain tactics. Um, people did get killed with the, the use of riot guns. And it's a, it was a constant struggle um, for various reasons that we're not going to get deeply into today. Check out that documentary. I'm, I'm sure that will be uh, worth a watch. Reason for picking this is a little bit more lighthearted, actually, um, as well as being significant in uh, British and Irish history as a type and as a product of the Webley and Scott Company, this you know, very, very storied firearms company. Uh, this also has a, a minor pop culture relevance as well. And that is in the Star Wars franchise. There's a, there are a few different less lethal launchers that crop up in the Star Wars franchise. Um, Boba Fett's gun being, being perhaps the most famous. Uh, there's the, the Jawa uh, blast as well. This was used by, uh, I believe the actor was Alan Harris, who played another bounty hunter. So uh, a rival slash associate of Boba Fett. Uh, the the, the lizardy looking chap. <laughs> uh, if you haven't, if you're trying to picture who that is, have a Google. So he's a bit of a background character in Empire Strikes Back, and he is carrying basically this thing with a couple of minor modifications. Um, those are uh, and the, the the hardcore cosplayers amongst you will already know this, but. So in the, in the muzzle, in this great big 37 or 38 millimeter is how, how it's described in Britain. Uh, to sort of cover that up and turn it into a blaster gun, there was a, uh, there was a cog from a, a radio control car kit, I believe it was. And in the middle of that was some sort of birdcage flash hider thing. Now, if anyone can figure out what that is, I haven't had time to go up and down the racks looking myself. It might be a fruitless trip. But if anyone knows what that is, it might not be a flash suppressor from a firearm, but it looks quite a lot like one. So challenge to the comments section. Tell me what that part is. Um, incidentally, the, um, check out the, the website Parts of Star Wars, um, created by a couple of guys, one of which was uh, Chris Trevis, who I've been in touch with over the years with various bits of, of Star Wars paraphernalia, because I am a nerd, among other things. Um, so there was that bit shoved in the front. That turned it from essentially a what could have been a grenade launcher type thing to something with a more focused sort of beam effect or capability. And then all the only other thing they really did was mount two um, M38 slash M40 Sherman tank scopes, which is the scope that's on the E11 blaster as well. One on the back and one on the front. I think it was reversed as well, if I remember rightly. So pretty much, pretty minimal um, disguise dressing for, for this thing as a Star Wars prop. These being a, a relatively obscure British riot gun are not super common outside the UK. And so I know fans have been scrabbling around looking for them. You can get a replica uh, to dress, to build out into a, a Bosque blaster. And now that I, I quite like when things like that loop back around. And in The Mandalorian, uh, season one at least, I don't, I think it crops up later. This thing crops up again as a sort of in-universe weapon. Um, I think when, when the, the, the townsfolk are being tra trained uh, to defend themselves. So it's in there. And that was actually one of the fan replicas. So you see that a lot with, with modern um, sort of revivals, especially, where they end up just going with what's available because the fans have done all the research. And that's quite nice. So sort of bring it back to, to reality um, briefly. The, this thing is, all riot guns tend, well, riot guns tend to be cheaply made. It's not to say they aren't well made, but they're made out of, or can be made out of uh, die-cast metals, um, 
lightweight materials. It's great to have a light thing to carry around all day. It doesn't, doesn't weigh you down if it doesn't need to bear the extreme pressure of a firearm cartridge, and these don't. So we have here a machined aluminium barrel section. Um, cast, you can probably see the sort of sand grain casting evidence on this piece here. And that extends all the way back here. A, a piece of fairly sort of, well, relatively, compared to some of the things we show you on this, on this series, cheap bit of, bit of hardwood as a buttstock. A rubber butt pad marked Webley. That's quite a, quite a nice touch. So that leaves the only steel components as components of the trigger mechanism. So the trigger itself is steel. Uh, the barrel latch, importantly, which will show you how that works. So it's, you bring this down to your hip, press probably with your thumb and tilt the barrel down. And you'll see we have, as well as the steel barrel latch, which is uh, serrated for obvious reasons, we have a steel breech face because that's bearing the most pressure and is getting the most wear from the rounds that are being inserted and the empty cases that are being pulled out and it's scraping metal on metal. So you want that to be steel and it is. And then a steel extractor here that is just getting levered outwards enough that you can pull out your empty case. Uh, in fact, we have here Now this is the, the original, as it says in the case there, rubber bullet mark one. And I believe early on uh, British Army and RUC would have would have had access to this particular type of ammunition. And uh, again, there's a whole uh, controversy over this form of soft rubber bullet versus the harder uh, PVC types that came later. But so w when when things are sort of kicking off quite 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 seriously, um, these things are what's flying around and they're sort of bouncing off the ground in, in, one, in one form of um, uh, use. Uh, they're intended to be sort of aerodynamic, but this is about as aerodynamic as a brick and, and so the rubber bullet that carries on gets uh, this bit sort of cut off and it's made out of a harder rubber. So 1973-ish onwards, you have um, basically harder projectiles that are Check out the documentary for the details. <laughs> but what this does allow us to do is, I'll just put the case in there gently. You can see how the case sits against the extractor and is sort of ratcheted or cammed, I, should, I suppose I should say, um, out enough that you can withdraw the case. And of course, it has a percussion cap, essentially a primer center fire, just like a normal round and a rim. And our firing pin emerges from here. In fact, if I just the once pull through on this very, very heavy double action trigger, you might have seen that, well, you would have seen that protrude out. So the, the very powerful trigger or strong uh, trigger spring, I should say, is uh, a design feature really to limit accidental discharge. The British Army's version of this, or equivalent to this, had a quite a clever safety latch, uh, or safety and, and barrel latch, that you would have to actively press in to fully latch the thing shut and allow you to shoot it. So that was an additional layer of safety. This thing, um, I mean, as far as I know, they didn't carry them around broken open like a shotgun, but when it's shut, the only thing stopping it from firing is your finger. So it needs to be quite strong. Downside of that, of course, is accuracy will suffer, but then this being smooth bore, it's not going to be very accurate anyway. You're firing into a group of people, essentially, not, um, not individual. Well, depending on the distance. And the final, the final feature, really, I mean, this, I suppose the stock is um, somewhat remarkable. In it's a sort of thumb hole, but that's not uncommon for, for this type of launcher. Um, but, but, yeah, you need a sighting system. So... This is a, one of the few pieces of steel on the gun, and it's, it's incredibly sharp, it's like a chisel. You just flip that up, and that gives you two different sight options. Um, I haven't actually checked what ranges those were intended for. Now, the trend with the British Army guns was to reduce the sighting option down to one, so soldiers aren't tempted to uh, change their point of aim and potentially hit someone in the head 
which is obviously a, a, a bad idea and not what you're supposed to do. So, but this being an earlier gun and not procured by the British Army, um, this one has the two options. But then the early, the early um, British Army guns did as well. That was more of a change over time. So we're lining up an aperture with this um, shiny steel front sight here. It's very prominent, can't really miss it. Hopefully that would help reduce unnecessary injuries. I say that's the last feature. There's a bit of an elephant in the room relative to the British Army's guns, which is that this has a foregrip. So vertical foregrips, of course, we're known from, we know from things like the Thompson early on, uh, and they are absolutely standard these days, or some, sort, some gripping aid at the front of the gun is, is standard, and Webley and Shermerley were somewhat ahead of the curve by having it on this gun, because the rivals didn't have that. There's a sling fitted from that foregrip, back to a, a swivel on the rear. Overall, it seems like a pretty serviceable um, anti-riot gun. Uh, it lacks the rifling of the L67 series, which is a, a significant drawback. Um, incidentally, I, th I believe that's a reason why uh, there was a move away from rubber to harder plastics, because uh, much like lead, you need something that will uh, fit, uh, engrave into the rifling and not be damaged, not be shredded or uh, or just resist, like rubber will squish as, as, it, as it's uh, gripped by rifling. That's all a bit tenuous though, um, it's probably perfectly possible to get rubber to, to, to spin stabilise, but my, my suspicion is that um, the move to PVC was partly prompted, or pl the plastic bullet as it was known, was intended to increase um, accuracy. And we have cast into the, the frame here, very simple, Webley Shermoli, made in England. Um, we have, uh, I considered opening the video with, here's, here's a G3, but that would have been very silly. Uh, don't know the significance of this, except that on this side of the butt, uh, well, we know this came from MOD, an MOD facility used for some sort of testing, but we don't have the details, unfortunately. Um, could be interesting in itself. And this, this says, gas gun number three. I think that must be the in-house sort of nickname for this, for recognition purposes. Uh, and then it has a note, a sort of aid memoir, 50 yards range, MPA, uh, mean point of aim, I believe, four inches below MPI, mean point of impact. So in other words, this thing shoots four inches low, so you'd have to correct for that. Now, I don't know which sight aperture they're talking about. Would have made sense to them at the time. Uh, it's, it's interesting to re try to read these little clues, but ultimately um, a lot of the history of, of this thing has, has been lost. But I wanted to, to, to show it to you because it's, it, it's quite a nice sort of... Um, it, it has the, the, the hard and the soft. It has the, the rather depressing um, social and military history, I suppose, uh, attached to it. And then it has this uh, lighter-hearted pop culture angle as well. Um, Always nice when there's more going on than just, just the one thing. Thanks so much for watching, guys. We really appreciate that. Um, if you'd like to come and visit us at one of our three sites, please do. We always appreciate um, physical visitors as well as digital. And you can check out our various social media uh, channels, uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Um, also, keep an eye on our website, well, and the socials as well, because we have a joust coming up, um, one of our big events that we're known for here at the Armouries. They're always a good time. Either way, however you engage with us, we'd like to see you again next time.